Hi everyone and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security aficionado Corey Nockreiner and this is the episode for the week starting July 21st, 2014. For the first of three stories, let's start with a software security update. Are you a Firefox user? If so, you're going to want to patch as soon as you can. During the week, Mozilla released Firefox 31, which fixes 11 vulnerabilities in the popular web browser, three being critical. And some of those critical vulnerabilities could allow remote attackers to execute code in your browser. So if a bad guy can trick you into visiting a malicious website or a site that's been hijacked to be malicious, he could take advantage of this flaw to silently and remotely download malware on your computer in a drive-by download attack. So definitely update Firefox. On top of that, Mozilla's added some new security functionality to try to make it harder for Firefox to download malware. Essentially, they've plugged into Google's Safe Browsing API. And Google basically maintains a list of well-known malware phishing sites, and now Firefox will prevent you from downloading files from those sites. By the way, they're going to continue to improve this functionality. In September, besides doing the Google Safe Browsing check, they're also going to start to check the signatures of the files you download to compare them to known white and black lists to make sure they're not known malware. So in essence, if you continue to update Firefox, it will be safer for you to download files online. Next up is flaws in a well-known anonymizing package. Ever since the NSA leaks, Edward Snowden has been giving security advice for how you can anonymize yourself or encrypt data that you transfer online. And one of the products he endorses is something called Tails. Tails is a bootable Linux distro that essentially has an automatic anonymizing framework set up. It attaches to this I2P network, which is essentially a type of peer-to-peer -peer network, so that your your network traffic gets anonymized by going through lots of different peers, making it harder for you know, law enforcement to figure out what you're doing online. Anyways, during the week, a security research firm, Exodus Intelligence, disclosed that Tails has some vulnerabilities in it. They didn't go into a ton of detail on these vulnerabilities. They've reported it to Tails and the maintainers of the I2P peer-to-peer -peer package so that they can fix them. And I don't think they'll disclose the technical details till they fix them. But long story short, they have disclosed the impact. Essentially, they say that the flawed component is the actual I2P or the peer-to-peer -peer component, and that a bad guy that's able to exploit this vulnerability can actually de-anonymize you. He can actually learn what real IP you're coming from. And on top of that, they state that they can use these vulnerabilities to force your machine to remotely execute code. So long story short, if you use Tails, you need to realize you can't totally trust it. You know, there's no software security package that's going to be perfect at doing what it says it does. Uh, there's always going to be new security vulnerabilities. The good news though is Tails and the I2P maintainers are going to probably update and fix these vulnerabilities. It will be safer to use in the future, but you always have to realize that any sort of anonymizing software is not perfect. Nonetheless, I still think Tails is pretty cool and if you haven't tried it out, you might want to give it a look. For the last and arguably biggest story this week, I'm going to cover the iOS backdoor. During the week, a researcher went to the HOPE, or Hackers of Planet Earth conference, and released information about these high-value forensic services that run on all iOS, which of course are iPad and iPhone, devices out there. The researcher, Jonathan Zajarski, who goes by the alias Nerve Gas, is essentially a well-known forensic researcher and security expert. He's written books on iOS security and helped the original jailbreaks. In any case, his presentation covered some hidden services or background services that aren't documented or previously weren't documented by Apple that actually share a lot of your private uh, data from your phone. I won't go into all the detail, but some of these services are things like 
com.apple.mobile file relay, which is a service that seems to, on Wi-Fi networks and when you plug your phone into USB, uh, give IT developers and people with physical access to your phone the ability to grab your SMS contacts, email account information, mobile text information, and all kinds of history and privacy data like that, despite the fact that Apple's default backup encryption should be encrypting that data if you've locked your phone. Nervegas also talked about a packet sniffing component. You probably didn't know that a developer or a, a technician can actually turn on packet sniffing on your iPhone and possibly grab that data. Furthermore, Zajarski talked about how a lot of these components are already used in commercial forensic software. So there's a number of forensic tools you can grab. And if you can get physical access to the phone, the iPhone or the iPad, and plug it into this tool, you can actually get all this data even if there's a passcode locking the device. So this is really interesting information, but is it a backdoor? Now later in the week, Apple of course responded, and of course they categorically denied these are backdoors. Rather, they say these are diagnostic tools used by developers and IT practitioners. And while they didn't really document these tools, they have since documented them a little, they say these were put there on purpose for basic diagnostic things. And they also say very strongly that it doesn't get past your PIN code or your backup password or backup encryption despite what uh, Zajarski says. So it's hard to know who to really believe here, but in either case, it's obvious there's a lot of tools on your phone that can share some of the private data. You know, if someone gets physical access to your phone, you should pretty much assume that your SMS contacts, messages, and things like that might be in the hands of someone you don't like. Anyways, it was a really interesting presentation. I'll be sure to post a link to it in the blog post associated with this video, since it has a lot of technical details that people that care might be interested in, and I'll also post a link to what Apple says about this. Now, as far as what you can do about it, if you're an iOS user, there's not much you can do about it. But since this particular talk, Apple has spoken a little bit about these tools. And if there's any sort of flaws with them as far as getting past the default backup encryption, I assume Apple will probably update iOS to make it stronger in the future. So I don't think iOS people should panic about it, but very interesting nonetheless. Well, that's it for this week. I hope it was educational and interesting. As always, there's a a lot of other stories out there. There's a new uh, botnet that goes after two-token banking and can infect your Android phone. There's stories about Wall Street Journal being hacked. So if you're interested in any of that other security news, be sure to visit the WatchGuard Security Center blog where I post this video and other stories as well. In the post for this video, I'll have a reference section that has links to all these other stories, so be sure to check those out. On top of that, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.